And welcome everyone to another Smart Money Circle up episode. I'm Adam Sarhan. With me today is Paul Worley, who's the CEO and president of Ascent Solar Technologies, ticker symbol ASTI. Paul, thank you so much for taking the time and welcome to the Smart Money Circle. Thank you for having me, Adam. I appreciate it. My pleasure. So, Paul, I always like to begin. Can you tell us a little about your story and how you got to where you are today, please? Okay. I have a a long history in alt energy. I put together the first landfill gas recovery unit in the early 90s, which basically effectively made waste management up. Landfill gas recovery unit that powers all of their equipment. They were a JV in it and, uh, you know, started there and now it's a couple billion dollar business. But did a lot of uh, uh, lending with GE Capital. We did a lot of uh, um, energy efficiency. We go into a company and we do the energy efficiency. Did that. Then I joined Deloitte's corporate finance group. And there I was on the worldwide green energy team. And so did a lot of work in solar and uh, um, buildings. Uh, We did work with USGBC, which you may be familiar with. And I sold a lot of solar projects and looked at raising capital for some other alt energy companies. Um, I was also the chief compliance officer. I knew I didn't want to be the chief compliance officer for a long period of time. So we kind of agreed for ways at the end of 2011 and, and went out on my own. And went out on my own, I did basically, I, I restructured a lot of different industries, anywhere from retail to oil and gas. Um, I did a lot of consulting with green companies. And so that's what kind of brought me to, let's see, this would have been 2021. The chairman reached out to me. He had a German investor looking to buy um, Ascent Solar. So he bought it. And then I did some consulting work for him in 2022. And uh so then they asked me to be the CFO in late 2022. So I, I came in as CFO, and then in April, they decided to um, make me CEO. So I was I have been CEO ever since. And so I've turned around a lot of businesses, so I sat everybody down. You know, it, it's tough because we were an R&D company for 18-plus years, and to, to – Spin it into what the marketplace needed was more uh, efficiency or watts produced per panel. So that's where I moved. The team was great. I mean, we went, we improved our efficiency 50, almost 50% in the six month period. So we did have relationships prior to that. And so we then started cranking up our relationships and we've been working on relationships for the last year and a half. Once we got, once we got to the efficiency numbers we needed in late October, early November of last year. Nice. And then let's talk about Ascent, please. Tell us about your business and some of your competitive advantages. Okay. So we, we, we're really only concentrating, I would say in two areas primarily solar and space, which 10 years ago, that was probably a, it was hard to tell, but it was probably a five to eight megawatt market. And in 10 years, it's going to be a 500 megawatt market. So that was one of the areas that, uh, A, we do very well in because of our product. And I'll go into that now. So this is our product. It's literally like a thick Christmas paper. And it rolls up like a thick Christmas paper. It rolls up like Christmas paper. So that does two things. The Chinese have roll up technology now. It's not like ours. It's a thinner film with with a crisp with crystalline on it. And so it is still heavy. So what are our advantages? Our advantages in space are 
Um, we have four or five advantages. We're much lighter, and it costs a lot of money to take stuff to space. So that's a key differentiator right off the bat. We have the capability of rolling up, which is important for um, DOD type stuff. Because what the Chinese do is they'll roll up their satellite, they'll reposition it a little bit, then they'll roll out the satellite again. And it takes you a while to reassess um, what, what happened to that satellite. Okay, because it's all done on a silhouette basis. That's how they track satellites. So, um, or primarily done on a silhouette basis. So we have that. We've been tested by JAXA, NASA, and, and a couple other companies in space. So we're TRL-9. We got that in March of this year. Um, I mean, so we're really set um, to go. And then, uh, um, <clears throat> so when you start talking about taking stuff closer to the moon and Mars, by the way, Mars doesn't have solar power. But to get to Mars, there's two ways. Go to the moon or you put up fueling stations. And if you put up fueling stations, as many people know, space goes from minus 60 to as hot as 200 degrees Celsius. Well, when it starts getting above 125, fuels tend to blow up in space. So you need a lot of solar to cool. So it depends where you want to go. If you want to go to the moon, there's a lot of solar that's going to be needed on the moon and above the moon. So you got that, and then you have the fueling stations, and there's going to be like five times as many satellites in the air in five years. So all of that is showing some pretty big growth. Um, so our product does um, does very well in space. Okay, we're, you know we have proven technology. We're much lighter. We're we're hopefully to go up and get some testing on whether we self anneal. So that means that there's a sun um, burst, a lot of radiation comes out. Our product on paper would self-anneal. So the radiation would hit it and, it, and our we would degrade, and then we actually come back when it cooled again. So we would actually come back and be just as efficient as we were before, which doesn't work on silicon. So those are some big areas in space. We're also involved in two areas that we call um, earth type stuff and that is power beaming and um, agrovoltaics. Uh, our product is very, very well suited for power beaming because it, you, you talk about multiples of suns when you power beam. So you have a sun and you go up to like a hundred suns. And our technology we're getting hopefully getting it tested in the next two weeks is supposed to go up to 20 to 40 suns. And most of the silicon stuff starts to melt at eight to ten suns. So that doesn't mean it's 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 faulty or anything. It just means you have to use a lot of coolant to keep it cool so it doesn't melt. So ours won't need as much coolant. So the coolant, the vehicle to cool it can be much smaller and much cheaper. So Got that's it. kind of that's kind of to sum us up. That's that's where we are. And again, we've had a lot of these relationships for several years, and and now we're kind of ready to go. I love it. I love it. I love it. The next frontier, I guess, that's where we're going. Yes. So, uh, from a risk standpoint, how do you handle risk, and what are some mistakes you see people make with respect to risk management? Um, I have a very we have a very very small staff 20 20 like 20 22 people most of them full-time some of them we bring in um occasionally At risk hasn't really been an issue because the cfo jen joe and myself come from a risk compliance background so i'm not too i'm not as concerned from a risk management the only the only thing i'm concerned with is um you know we have enough cash to last until the into the first quarter of 2025 or into 20 or into the second quarter of 2025. Um, and so, you know, we, we have cash. So I, I'm not as concerned. Now we've just got to, we got to bring in some business. 
That's my primary, that's my risk management, bringing in business. We added two board advisors. One was an, is a retired two-star general that ran procurement for the Air Force. He had over, I think, a hundred billion dollar budget. He's helped, he's helped us plug into places that might have, we would have gotten in there, but he he sped things up by six to 18 months. And then um, the the one of the founders of SpaceX is intertwined with a lot of companies in the space market. And he's helped introduce us to companies inside the space arena. Nice. And then, uh, Paul, what about some timeless lessons that you've learned along the way and that you'd like to share with the audience, please? Don't always believe that you can do something. If you don't believe you can do it, you don't. I turned around two oil field service companies when a barrel of uh, uh, when I started, barrel of, of oil was seventeen or nineteen dollars a month right. before it was negative or two dollars. Um, and so these were tough companies, levered everything else. But we just went in there, and then we just we just picked off certain things to look at saving money. Both of them are still uh, um, around today. I mean, this company, you know, we probably nearly died three or four times. And we made it through. Love it. So how about timeless mistakes you've seen people make and or you've made and how do you avoid them? Okay. Um, one mistake I made, I really, I really wasn't part of it, but it was a mistake. Um, when I was brought in, it was too late to close. It was too late because the deal was going to close, but we had a convertible debt deal and it had what's called exploding warrants on it. They reset during certain events and that caused a lot of problems. <laughs> we got rid of those in um, late March, early April this year. So they're gone. That helps my capital structure and helps us ability to raise capital. Um, so that was a, a mistake. I would also I would also tell you that when you see a problem, you need to address it as quickly as possible. Okay, because if you don't address it as qu quickly as possible, then you have it, it causes more problems. I'll give you an example. On one of the uh, um, oil field service companies, you know, we we turned around. We had a lease that was horribly out of market. OK, and I wanted to address it this way, a certain way. And then the CEO said, no, 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 no. We can't do it because of this customer, or that customer. And I said, well, um, if we can't pay the lease payment, <laughs> then we're going to have an issue later, potentially later on. So we didn't do anything but just say three or four weeks later, <laughs> an event's happened. And uh, um, it all worked out, but it could have it could have been a bad um, it could have affected the company dramatically. We could have shut down. So I would say make decisions quickly. A okay decision is better than waiting three weeks for a bad decision because certain events hit you that makes any decision bad. Got it. That's it. So it's almost like keep your losses small when you're wrong. It's going to happen. We're all human. Be wrong fast and be wrong quick and short and small instead of compounding that mistake by either ignoring it or putting it under the rug and then more things go under the rug and then eventually it just explodes. Is right. that kind of what you're saying? Okay. Makes yeah, that, that's that's what I'm saying. You know, we it, one of the blessings we have at this company yeah. is we had all the equipment sitting here. So I had, you know, cost-wise, 80 to $100 million worth of equipment sitting here. But it had never really been run, I would say, fully. So we, I basically sat down with the guys, and they said, well, here's what we can do where we think we can improve efficiency. Okay, so let's get started and go. So the first couple of months, I mean, we went for the fence, okay? And we hit the fence once. And then we, uh, but we didn't hit the fence a couple of times. But so... We then changed formulas. We did some other stuff. And then we, we went from, um, you know, 10 
roughly 10% efficiency up to about 14% efficiency. Then to two or three months later, we hit 17.7% efficiency. So, um, and now we have a great product, tiny different chemical formulation, and we run it a little slower. And that created the situation. Because um, we, historically, they've been looking at massive volume requirements and they ran the equipment, to be quite honest with you, <laughs> they run the equipment for the hell of running the equipment. And it just wasn't going to produce the amount of uh, um, voltage you needed. And to some degree, the way this company was, when it was first started, it was a very well thought of, very good company. But these little things right here, they went from using the amount of power they used 20 years ago or 15 years ago was far less than this. So they were doing stuff to put on the back of a cell phone. And back when they first started it, it took them four or five years to get there. But when they first started it, it might charge a cell phone 20 to 30, 40%. When they got there, it would charge 7 to 10%. So it didn't really, you know, it wasn't going to do much good. So got it. That makes sense. That would be a mistake. Looking back on this company, the mistake was you should have moved faster and swung for the fences more often because then they could have potentially gotten the product out to market. And then if they started selling, it gives them a lot more flexibility of improving the product once you have revenue. Got it. Makes perfect sense. How about leadership? Uh, as a CEO, and you've been around for a while now, what makes a great leader and what are some lessons you've learned about leadership that you'd like to share with the audience? First, you, you to be humble, okay? Because you know, there's a lot of situations where, you know, you you might have to go to another room and scream, but you you, you have to be humble and you have to listen very well. And then you have to make decisions based on what you heard. And then you can discuss those decisions to tweak them. But those are the decisions you need to move forward. Got it. Now that makes perfect sense. And how about adversity and some obstacles you had to overcome? How do you handle adversity? I love what you just said about walking away and screwing. So make sure that you separate the reaction from the actual event. But how do you handle adversity and, and what are some obstacles you had to overcome? We had a little bit of adversity like the first week or two after uh, um, we got rid of the CEO. So, you know, there were some people, he, he, there were people aligned with him. And then there were people, um, I wouldn't say aligned with me, there were people aligned with him. Then you had company players, okay? Um, so that created a bit of adversity, okay? Because we got rid of a couple of people. Um, and so anyway, that was probably one of the bigger things. And then liquidity was probably my biggest adversity trying to turn the company around, having enough liquidity to make it. Got it. No, that makes perfect sense. Final question for you, Paul, what is the best piece of advice you'd like to give the audience or your 30 year old self? My 30 year old self. <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, look, America's built on people working hard. If you work hard, it will pay off. Um, you know, I didn't come from a silver spoon background and uh, I've always worked very hard. And I, I was I was in the reserves early on in my career. So, I, I, you know, I had a dual life, Army Reserves and a banker. Um, and so just work hard and absorb, listen to people and absorb them. Got it. Well, thank you very much for your service, Paul. This has been fantastic. We look forward to uh, keeping in touch and hopefully we'll have you on again soon. This was great. I hope so. Thanks, Adam. Thanks, Paul.